Linking animations to our scroll position on a page has never been easier thanks to the Web Animations API and scroll timeline, making animations like this one a breeze. Hello, my friend and friends. Thank you so much for coming to join me once again. And if you're new here, my name is Kevin. And here at my channel, I help you fall madly, deeply in love with CSS. But today we're taking a bit of a different path because we're actually going to be exploring some JavaScript. Over on my Discord, it was suggested that I take a look at making scroll-based animations. And with how easy it is to do with the Web Animations API and scroll timeline now, it seemed like a really good time to jump in and take a look at that. First, we're going to do a very simple thing, which you see all over the place, which is those scroll position trackers that go across the top of a page, just to understand a little bit on how all of this works. And then we're going to step things up and explore a little bit more of what we can do by making those images that can slide in and appear and really do anything you want with those types of things. All right, so as you can see, I've already written some uh, HTML here, but it's just a whole bunch of content basically. And I've put a couple of pictures in here that we can play with, and it's from the site actually, it's the same image. Uh, that was asked if I could recreate this with. Um, but yeah, we're going to do one extra line of HTML here just to get things started. So I'm going to do a div of scroll tracker, just like that. And we're just going to leave it blank with that div in place. This is just really for decorative purposes, but let's come over to here and we're going to do my scroll tracker. And we're going to, let's start by giving this a height. Of, uh, we'll say 0.5 rem. We'll give it a background color and that could be, I have some variables set up. So I'm just gonna do color primary 400, which should give it a blue color and there it is. But we do want to do one more thing with this. Um, let's give this a position of fixed. And the reason I'm doing position fixed is because when I scroll, I wanna make sure that it always stays in view. And because I'm going to put a position fixed on this, this position fixed will actually make, right now the default width is 100%. It's gonna shrink down to zero. So if I hit save, it seems to vanish. We could just give it a width of 100%. Uh, but what I'm gonna say is inset because I wanna set a top of zero anyway. So I'm gonna do an inset of zero, zero, auto. And inset is a shorthand for top, bottom, left, and right. And so this is my top and it's like margin. So with three properties, that would be my left and my right. And then the auto of zero just means sort of ignore the bottom property almost. And there we go, we get my scroll tracker that's there, but obviously we want this to actually track our position. Now, interestingly, this is something that I did recently with CSS only uh, using scroll timeline. And what we're looking at today is actually built on the same technology that makes the scroll timeline possible. The only issue is scroll timeline right now has basically no support other than like on the cutting edge browsers and behind flags and things like that, which isn't re very realistic. And so this is very similar in how it functions Though we're going to be doing everything in JavaScript and even on the JavaScript side, the support isn't fantastic, but we have a polyfill that we're going to be able to use. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually just paste in the link to the polyfill here. So I'm just importing this uh, directly and I'll put a link to this polyfill there, which has a little bit more information on how you could use it within your projects. But for a simple demo like this, just importing it at the top of my JavaScript is perfect. Though if we do want to bring it in as an import statement like this, this does have to be a module. So luckily it's easy enough to do. You just come into here and you can write type is equal to module. And just to show you, if I hit save now, it, nothing should be a problem. Let's go look in our console. Uh, there's no errors if, uh, actually let's not go there. Let's save this file too. Um, if I come here and I remove the type equals module, you'll see that I, we get a syntax error. So just, if you want to have that import statement at the top, um, just make sure you have that so that it can work. And so let's close that and we can jump back on over into our JavaScript. All right. And now we get to jump into the fun bits. And if you follow me, you might not be doing a lot of JavaScript. So if that's the case, I will try and take things slow enough because even for me, JavaScript isn't um, always the most comfortable thing in the world, at least compared to CSS. Uh, so first I'm going to make a const of scroll tracker just so we can have, you know, we, we need to tell it what to, what we're going to be playing with here. So let's do a document dot, uh, query selector and on the query selector that is going to be for my scroll tracker, right? That should do that, the trick on that one. And then we want to use this somehow. So before we do anything with the scroll tracker, what I'm going to do is actually, because we will be writing a bit of JavaScript, it does take up more room than CSS. So let's make that a little bigger. And the first thing we want to do, I'm going to create a const and I'm going to call this scroll tracking timeline. And the name of it is whatever you want to name it here. But what's important here is that we use a new and it's going to be a capital S scroll timeline. And then we're going to have an object. So I'm going to open and close my curly braces. 
And inside of there, we have a few different things that we can define. In this case, we're actually gonna be sticking with the defaults, uh, but we're, I'm still gonna show the different options that we have here. So you have a source. And by default, the source is the entire viewport because that's your scrolling element. If you wanted to do this within a different element that does scroll, this has to be something that scrolls. So if you wanted to do something different that scrolls, you could list out the source here. Um, what this actually is, we're gonna do document.scrolling element. Uh, another one that we can have here is our orientation. orientation. And we have block or inline. So do you want it to be block is going to be up and down scrolling. And if you wanted to look for uh, inline, so left to right scrolling or horizontal scrolling, you could just switch that there. And the last thing we're going to do is what's the range that we're actually looking at. Now for that range, it's called scroll offsets. And the scroll offsets, we're going to have to tell it the starting point and the ending point. And for this, you just put it inside your square brackets. And there's different ways we can do this. I'm going to do capital, all capital CSS dot percent and put a zero. And then we'll put a comma and then do CSS dot percent and do 100. So we're checking from zero all the way to 100. But we'll sort of look at what this does a little bit in a second. The problem right now is we've set this up. We have a scroll timeline, so it's going to be paying attention to our scrolling from the top all the way down to the bottom of our page, looking at the block orientation and again of the entire document. And these two, again, we could actually omit those and it should work just fine. But we're looking at a demo, uh, so I'll leave those on there. Uh, but what we need to do now is we actually have to use this somewhere to actually get this to work. So to do that, we want to attach it to our scroll tracker that we have right here. So for this, we're going to do scroll tracker, tracker, come on, there we go, uh, dot animate. Nice and easy. And we're going to come in here. I'm going to push return and then open and close some curly braces because we have a couple of different objects that we're going to be working on here. And inside this first one, what we want to do is say what we're actually going to be animating. What are the properties we're doing? So the first property, um, and with a tracker like this, you could be animating the width. You could also be doing, uh, if we'd set this up a little bit differently, we could animate the width. If you wanted to do it by using your left and your rights, whatever it is, because it's a scroll based animation, I don't know actually what the implications are of animating things that normally we'd be a little bit more concerned about. So that's something to look into. But I think like the idea of like a buttery smooth animation might be a bit less important here since it's really linked to your scrolling positions. Um, but what we're going to do for this one is I'm just going to do a, I'm gonna say we're gonna animate our transform property. And then we're gonna open and close square brackets. And I wanna tell it what we're, and a little bit like we did with our scroll offsets, we're gonna say what the beginning transform is and what the end transform is. So here we're going to say scale x of zero, and then I'm going to put scale x, and I made a mistake here, of uh, one. And the mistake for that is you just want to make sure that these are wrapped inside of parentheses, not parentheses of uh, quotations. So there we go. And so that's set up. Now, we, as I said, we will have multiple objects here. So I'm going to do a comma. And then we're going to open and close another set of curly braces. And inside this one, it might seem a little bit silly, but you're going to need a duration. Now, this animate is not part of only the scroll timeline that we're looking at, which is right here, the new scroll timeline. This is part of the web animations API. So durations here could be used for other things. It's not necessarily to link it to scroll based animations and just know it's always in milliseconds, as you would expect with JavaScript. Uh, but really the duration has no impact here since we're going to be linking it, but we're going to throw one on there anyway. Uh, and the other thing we want is to say what the timeline is. And in this case, it's my scroll tracking timeline that we created right here. And with that, we should be good to go, except I think block here actually needs to be inside quotation marks as well. I do apologize for that. Let's hit save and it's still not working because scroll timeline. Look, it vanished. There we go. That's good news. And now it's growing. There we go. A few little hiccups there, but everything's working. Uh, except it's kind of weird that it's growing from the middle and not from the left. So eh, kind of weird. So let's come back to my CSS. And I guess I lied to you a little bit uh, in that we, we won't be writing any, just a little bit. Um, let's just do a transform origin of left. That should fix the whole problem. And that should give us, there we go. As we scroll down, it goes. And when we reach the bottom of the page, it's full, and when we get to the top of the page, uh, we don't have anything there. And as I said, we can play around with some of the numbers. So maybe you have a footer and you don't care about the footer, in, you know, so you could set this to 80%, let's just say. Uh, and then it will track it. When you get to 80% of the way down the page, it's showing that it's full. And of course, you know, you have something at the top that you don't want it to count. So at the very beginning, there's nothing. But then once I get past a certain point, 
that comes in, or maybe you don't want this as a percentage, you can put that as pixels, and I could say 250 pixels. And so now it will only start once I get to 250 pixels, it will start tracking. So, you know, you could even get JavaScript to get the height of this and then use that as the value that's coming in here, whatever you want. I'm going to just do it for my whole page. So we'll leave that as a percent, just like that. All right. And with that done now, let's see how we can take this the next step and look at how we can animate these images. So we're not watching the whole page, but we're going to watch for the specific image locations. So the first thing we're going to do one image first and then look at how we can have it apply to as many as we want. Uh, and we're sort of exploring, going to explore different sort of properties and different things that we can do with this um, as we go through on this one. So uh, the first thing we're going to go to my index and you can see I have this image in here, which has my image rotate in class. So the first thing we should do is get that image. And so we're going to do a const of, we'll call it animated image is going to be equal to document .query selector, And we'll choose that uh, dot image rotate, rotate in just like that. And so we've selected this image that's right here and we can do very similar. We're going to set up a timeline first and then we're going to animate it. Uh, one big difference is what we're going to do with our scroll offsets. So let's start by const and we'll call it animated image timeline is equal to a new scroll timeline. And in this, we're going to have our, well, we don't need to have the source or the orientation. Um, as I said, when we did this, these are defaults. So I'm just going to go in with my scroll offsets. And for the scroll offsets this time, we're actually going to do something a little different, like I said. Uh, and we're going to look at two different approaches. I'm going to look at the first one, which is going to watch the image itself, enter the viewport and leave the viewport. And that's actually going to work a lot like how an intersection observer works. Um, which is probably the last time I talked in depth about JavaScript, but, uh, yeah, we're going to do that first and I'll look at a limitation of that and then a more involved solution that might be closer to what you actually want to do. And so here on my scroll offsets, what we can do is we're going to open and close some curly braces because what we can do now is actually define a target. So my target in this case is going to be my animated image. Uh, we're going to have an edge and for now, just trust me on this one. I'm going to do end and we're going to do a threshold threshold of one. And I'm going to duplicate this line here. And don't worry, I'm going to explain it all more in a second. We're going to put a start here. Now, what's interesting about this is this is actually when the animation will start and this is when it's going to end. So it might seem a little bit strange having the edge as a start and an end. Uh, but trust me on it. This is what we want. <laughs> uh, and as I said, we'll explore this in a little bit more detail. And I just see a syntax error here because I forgot my uh, my comma at the end of that line. So that should be enough as long as I didn't make any other typos here. And actually I did. These should be also inside of quotation marks. Uh, so there we go. We get my threshold of one on both of those and thresholds a scale of zero to one, but we'll look at that more. Um, but if you're used to intersection observers, that is, uh, you, you're probably familiar with that, what that is. And just like we had set up our scroll tracker animation here, we're going to do the same thing here. So we're going to do my animated image animate, uh, open and close our parentheses, and then we can open and close my curly braces. And we're going to do multiple different properties rather than just one, but we're going to start with one and then add the other ones on top. And the first thing is I'm going to do a transform and we're going to go from a rotate rotate of X on the X axis of 45 degrees, which is going to rotate the image this way. Now for this on the transform, we actually need to do a bit more for it to look good, but I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so let's just see what this is going to do first and then here rotate uh, to a zero. And yeah, that should work perfectly. Then let's come here and do a comma. I open it another set of curly braces and my duration should be a one. And my timeline in this case will be my image. Uh, what do we call it? Animated image, whoops, animated image timeline. And so we should be able to hit save on that. Oh, I see something changed in my image already. So that's a good sign. And now as I scroll, you can see the image is sort of on squishing itself, <laughs> which isn't exactly what we wanted, but at least it's doing something. <laughs> um, and so let's start with that. And what you'll notice, it's not nothing's happening. And now all of a sudden it starts and maybe we should do this even more. Let's do 90 degrees. So or 180. So that should make it no, 180 shouldn't. Yeah, there we go. A 90 makes it vanish. So it's completely flat. And then as we scroll up, it's flattening itself out. 
And when the top of the image reaches the top of the viewport, it will be completely done. And to explain how this is working, I'm actually gonna bring in uh, this here, which is a code pen. I'll link this in the description as well by Bramis, which um, shows we have a starting edge and our ending edge. So start, we can do start and then end. And then we have the threshold. And a threshold of zero means the animation will start when the element has touched the ending edge. Or if we look at the starting edge, it's as soon as the element has left completely the viewport. Like as soon as it's touching the top of the viewport, but completely out. If we move this threshold, you can see how it's moving it into the viewport, which is sort of the blue area that we have here. And then when we get to here, that means when the threshold is one, so it's completely within the viewport and it's touching the starting edge. Um, and so what this is doing, so that's why we're having the animation start at the ending edge, because that's the bottom of the viewport. And we're having the animation finish at the start of our viewport, which is at the very top. So it might sound a little strange, but it sort of, it, it makes sense when you look at it that way. So here, if we actually change this to a zero and a zero, that means the animation is starting now, even though the image isn't on the screen yet, because it's, you know, it's starting a little bit earlier. And then here it's finishing, it's still animating until it's all the way off the screen. So I think a lot of the time you probably want a threshold of one, though it's possible you want something a little different than that. And so to improve this a little bit, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna come here and add perspective, perspective. And I'm doing it here. I'm actually keeping my, I'm gonna keep the perspective the same on both of these. So transform perspective, and it, this is just gonna make it actually look sort of 3D-ish. And this is a number I find I just have to play with. I'm not very good at this. Um, so let's add a perspective there and a perspective here. And so now you can see it actually gets more of like this here. It's completely flat and you know, it looks more like you'd expect it to look right uh, for this type of thing. So it's completely linked to the scrolling of my viewport, which is cool. Now I think it's a little too much. So let's, I'm going to start it at 45. So when it enters the viewport, it's sort of tilted a little bit. As soon as it comes in a bit more, it starts tilting and then it finishes at the top. And to make it a little bit nicer, we have transform here, but we could also come in and say opacity. Uh, and my opacity, we could have it go from a zero to an opacity of one. And so now if we look at it, it's completely gone. And then as I scroll, the opacity will come in and it will rotate up. And yeah, I just think it looks a little bit nicer with the opacity. Maybe you could actually start it at like a 0.5 or something just so it's not completely vanished when it comes in, it's a little bit there. And actually maybe here the threshold of zero and this being at zero uh, could, could potentially be better. So it's starting to fade in as soon as it enters the viewport, but then it's completely in view and completely finished by the time it reaches the top of the viewport. Now what you might actually like is that it's completely finished the animation here. Uh, but before we worry about that, let's see how we could actually get this to work over multiple images. And I'm not saying this is the animation that you'd necessarily want to do over multiple images. Now, luckily to do that, it's actually really easy. Uh, it's just here, let's come up and here I have my animated image. Let's make this plural so it's a bit better. And here I'm going to do a query selector all. So it's selecting all of my images with that class, which I have this one and there is a, another one here. So we have my two identical images in this case. Um, and this will also show us a little bit of a limitation of the scroll timeline here that we have, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but basically everything here can stay exactly the same. The only difference is right here. So the first thing we're going to do is let's say my animated images and we need to say for each and for each one of the image image for each image inside of my animated images we want to do something. So we'll throw an arrow function in here and let's, there we go. Perfect. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab this here and drop it right in here. But instead of my animated image here, and then I can bring each one of those down right here. Uh, I'm just going to save to format the code a little bit better. And I'm just going to then take all of this. We can take all of that and I'll show you actually, we're gonna, let's take all of this first and just to make this actually work, we can bring it all into here. And now it should work for both of my images. And here we also, this one just, I had that as animated image before. So we just wanna uh, actually remove all of that and make that my image as well. So for each image, we're gonna have this animation running that's using this scroll timeline right here. Uh, and the only reason that I'm putting this inside the for each here is just so the target is it's creating a new target for all of the images that are getting that class. 
And now we can see that it's working for both of those images. So as I go down, there's one, there's the other one. Perfect. Now, one thing you could do if you don't like this idea of having this here and having this here is we could actually take all of this for where it says new scroll timeline and select all of that. And so let's take that and I'm going to comment out this entire section. And then when we have a timeline here, instead of looking back at that timeline, we can actually put all of that here where you actually just make a new timeline right there. So if I hit save now, it's still working just as it was before. It's exactly the same thing that we just had. So if we, you know, you don't have too much going on over here, it could be a simpler way to do it. The nice thing with having these is sometimes you'll have multiple different objects using or sharing one timeline. So having this on its own here lets you point multiple different things at it. Whereas in this situation, it's very stuck to being only for the image and that's it. And as I said, there's one more thing, which is we don't always want it to start here. Maybe I only want the animation to start once we're past this threshold of one, or we want it to finish before we're at this threshold of one over here. And with the threshold, we can't actually do that. So I'm going to comment out these scroll offsets here, and I'm going to bring in a, a very new scroll offsets. Um, and it's going to take a little bit of a similar approach than we did here with our CSS percentages, but it's going to be a little bit more complex. Um, so actually the first thing for each one of these images, we are going to get something. Um, so what I'm going to do is create a new variable here called image offset top. And sometimes I get questions on here, const or let. Um, const works because it's doing it for each image uh, individually. So it can be a const, it doesn't get redefined anywhere. And so for that, my image offset top is going to be equal to the image. And we can just do an offset top. And then I'm also going to do a const of image height. And that's going to be equal to my offset height, just like that. Uh, so that should give, give me those values for both images that we have. And as I said, that's just because we're going to use these in a bit of a different way. So here, what, what I want to do is I'm actually going to say that the first offset, uh, we're going to do a CSS pixel, but we're going to use all of these. So we want to get my image offset top plus my image height. And we're going to do those together minus my win, uh, window dot inner height. And so that's where the start and I'll explain this in a second. And let's just put a comma here. And then the second one is going to be a CSS pixel as well. And for this one, I'm just going to say my image offset top. And we're going to change these in a second. But that should work. There we go. So you can see that's working. And okay, let's explain what this is doing. So we're saying my image offset top. So how far the image is from the very top of the viewport. So from here, all the way down to the top of the image is this, this one right here. Then we're adding my image height to it. Um, actually, I, what I mean, if we didn't do it with the image height here, it would be the same as having a threshold of zero. It would kick in as soon as the image uh, is at the very bottom. Whereas now what I've done is pretty much replicated this idea of a threshold of one. As soon as the entire image has entered the viewport, it's going to start. And then here, the offset image offset top is the same thing that we had right here. So you might be saying, Kevin, you just did a whole bunch of stuff to replicate what we had here. And I did. It's true. But the, the one advantage we have here is then you could throw extra numbers in here. So for example, if I wanted it to end 200 pixels before the top, I could just do a minus 200. So let's hit save on that. And now we'll see the animation is completely done here. So we're not getting to the threshold of one, we're getting to a threshold of like minus 200. And then we can do that same thing over here. I don't know if this would be a plus or a minus. Let's try plus 200 <laughs> and let's just see. Yeah, so now it's getting, it's doing nothing. And then once we're 200 pixels past the entire image, the bottom of the image is 200 pixels away from the bottom, then it's going to start that animation. And so it's not perfect by any means. Uh, I don't think I necessarily want it to start there. So even you can have it start before it even enters the viewport with a minus there. So it's starting, it's already going, and then it's finished before we get to there. And maybe we'll make that a minus 300. So that way you sort of get the, in, instead of having to wait until in this case, we're revealing it at the very top, we're allowing it to happen much, much sooner. And so just a couple of ideas there that you could do, but this does show the one other limitation of this is as I scroll back and forth, it's always running the animation. And that could be a little bit annoying. You might want this to, you know, if, if you're doing it for certain reveals, it could be a nice thing. Or if you're doing it for your tracker up here, it could be a good thing. 
if you're doing this for image things that slide in and then they're sliding in and then somebody scrolls up and they slide away and then they slide back in and then they slide away, that could actually be kind of annoying. And you don't necessarily want to be linking the sliding in animation to the scrolling itself like we are here. Like this is kind of cool because it's really linked to that because the rotation of the image is based on that. That might be something you want. If you just want something to appear on the screen once it gets to the right place, well, that's where an intersection observer would come in. And if you'd like to know more about intersection observers, or you'd like to know how this is all going to work with CSS only, because this will be a CSS only thing at one point once browser support gets there, well, I've looked at both of those and you can see those videos right here. And with that, I want to say a really big thank you to my supporters of awesome over on Patreon, Jan, Johnny, Stuart, Tim, and Simon, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.